Israel has intensified its offensive on Khan Yunis and other parts of Gaza with media reports indicating that hospitals and education facilities are being targeted. The death toll in the region has crossed 25,000 since October 7th with over 63,000 injured. Meanwhile, the impact of the war on the region also continues to escalate. We go to Abdul for the details. Abdul, thank you so much for joining us. A very brutal Israeli offensive taking place in the southern parts of Gaza as we speak. So could you tell us what's happening uh, right now? Uh, as per the latest reports coming from Khan Yunis, particularly, there is a ground offensive going on there. And, and the videos which are, which are there circulating on social media and media channels shows that uh, Israeli forces have completely uh, destroyed entire neighborhood uh, consisting, consisting of around 40 plus houses, Palestinian houses. They have completely detonated it uh, with uh, explosive. Uh, there are also reports coming uh, that the Nasir hospital uh, has been under attack. Uh, uh, more than a, a dozen Palestinians have been killed and uh, the number of P Palestinians killed in the hospital and uh, in and around that lo uh, locality is uh, increasing every hour as the reports coming from the ground. There is, uh, it is very similar to the attacks which were carried out in the northern Gaza, in al uh, uh and Al-Quds hospitals, uh, uh, and uh, and that is exactly what the Israeli forces are repeating. Apparently, they are claiming that they have found evidences in some of the houses destroyed by, by it that the Israeli captives uh, were uh, were kept there, and hence the Israeli Defense Ministry claiming that they will be able to kind of. Uh, get the hostages released. Of course, this is a bogus uh, uh, claim. They have claimed it before also. And in none of those instances, there was any uh, success. Uh, in fact, uh, is when uh, there was uh, reporting, sorry, when the Hamas proposed uh, uh, last week about a kind of uh, ceasefire in exchange of the release of hostages, uh, Israeli Prime Minister has completely rejected it. And this rejection continues despite the fact that there are reports coming from inside Israel of how uh, the the family members of the hostages have been demonstrating uh, in front of the Israeli parliament, not letting uh, uh, the people move, go in and out of the parliament, uh, demanding uh, uh, the release of the hostages and the ceasefire. So, yeah, that is the latest thing which is coming. Um, uh, as per the latest report, Netanyahu met with the family members protesting uh, in, uh, in in Jerusalem, uh, occupied Jerusalem. But uh, the results of that meeting is not yet clear. Right, Abdul, uh, we also need to talk about the regional dimensions that are taking place. So how is the impact on the larger region, on larger West Asia itself continuing? Well, uh, if you see what uh, uh, Saudi Foreign Minister uh, said in, uh, in Davos, basically that reflects the mood of the larger region. Uh, since the beginning of this uh, round of Israeli war in Gaza, there has been a consistent uh, uh, position taken by the Arab countries in the region that, that there is no alternative to two-state solution and Israel has to agree with it. And uh, we should remember that last we talked, Netanyahu had completely rejected the two-state solution in a way. Uh, so yeah, uh, so Saudi Arabia, uh, the similar statements were uh, repeated by Jordanian uh, uh, officials, Jordanian foreign minister, and of course, if you see uh, the 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 excess of resistance, which is basically has been raising a kind of resistance against the Israeli war in Gaza and the U.S. support to the Israeli war uh, in Gaza uh, has been continuously striking against both the Israeli and the U.S. targets wherever it is possible. On Sunday, there, were, there was a report coming of the latest round of attacks against uh, U.S. base in uh, Ayn al-Assad in Iraq, where uh, a couple of U.S. soldiers uh, are reportedly injured. And this is one of the largest attacks so far um, uh, on, an, uh, on an U.S. base. Uh, and of course, if you see the Houthis uh, continue to, despite the fact that Houthi has been designated as terrorist and being bombed by the U.S. and U.K., they have been resisting uh, 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 the uh, what they have stood with their position of not letting any ship pass through the Red Sea to Israel. Uh, 
similarly uh, hezbollah has been in fact there are, there is a report coming on uh, sunday night that hezbollah basically attacked an israeli uh, military base uh, and uh, uh, led to which, uh, which also led to certain casualties of course this was in response to israel bombing uh, southern gaza killing one of the top leaders of hezbollah in the region so if you see uh, in and around the region there is uh, uh, both uh, active armed resistance to israeli war in gaza uh, ongoing by the axis uh, uh, the the axis of resistance forces and also uh, the diplomatic pressures which are uh, applied uh, by the arab countries to uh, to force israel and the us also to basically come to table and find a solution uh, which can bring peace to the region and that is the two state solution Uh, independent of Palestine, uh, independent Palestinian state. Right, Abdul. Thank you so much for the update. The current constitution of the Philippines was drafted in the aftermath of the mass movement that overthrew the dictator Ferdinand Marcos Sr. in one thousand, nine hundred and eighty-six. Now, under the presidency of his son Bongbong Marcos, there are efforts to revise the constitution and change some of the economic clauses. However, critics say that this will further help entrench the current elite. We go to Anish to understand what is happening. Anish, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, quite a bit of controversy building up over this proposal to amend the constitution of the Philippines. So, before coming to some of the arguments as to why uh, you know people are unhappy with this, could you maybe take us through what is this process of amendment itself? What are the proposals being talked about? Yes. So, uh, right now, what we are looking at is an attempt to create what is called as a People's Initiative. As per uh, the Philippine Filipino Constitution, uh, where uh, you'll have to collect a certain number of signatures to put into place a constitutional uh, amendment or a charter change, as they say, uh, which can actually uh, affect a lot of uh, you know very fundamental laws uh, of the Philippines, and which were pretty much you know more or less, if not remained unchanged, but they more or less remained uh, stable since the 1986 EDSA revolution. Now the thing is that uh, this uh, entire process uh, that is being pushed by this group called as Perma, uh, which is a People's Initiative for Reform, Modernization, and so on, uh, is uh, something that is uh, pushing for only very specifically economic uh, amendments in the Filipino Constitution, which would uh, which would actually affect uh, you know clauses that uh, deal with foreign ownership and foreign investments. uh in especially into areas which were which are still considered to be complete no no uh like in for instance mining uh resource exploration and so on uh or even agroforestry uh or even land uh, the use of agricultural land or the ownership of agricultural land uh which are completely out of bounds for foreign investors uh if that might be opened up if this obviously uh is something that is being affected and this is something that is also being uh, pushed for by uh, various people in the government uh, many lawmakers who are very pro government or who sit in the you know the marcus junior uh, supporting block within the congress and all of them pretty much are keen on these uh, economic clauses more than anything else obviously there have been previous uh, attempts to even change the political character of the constitution uh, take out uh, you know uh, term limits and even you know put in a parliamentarian type of government but that's a different set altogether right now what we are looking at is a lot of resources and a lot of money uh, being pushed into it this whole process became especially controversial because perma the group that has been pushing for uh the sort of people's initiative which is a difficult thing to begin with uh has uh, put out this ad uh, earlier this month uh, which had the hashtag called etsapera which is a, a word play which means that pe- which could imply that there are people who have been left out in the 1987 etsa revolution and that uh, kind of uh, you know seeks to undermine the it's a revolution the democratization process that happened and also the constitution that came with it because the constitution was something that uh, you know that pushed for very pro people policies at the time that uh, requires even now uh, or protects the country from uh, you know very uh, predatory kind of foreign capital that can uh, you know influence or even destroy uh parts of uh, the filipino economy 
Uh, and considering the history that Philipp Philippines has had uh, when it comes to foreign investment and foreign capital, this uh, this is something that uh, this whole classification or you know trying to undermine the revolution itself is something that a lot of people have been uh, alarmed by at the current moment, obviously. Right. So, Anish, coming to some of those concerns, why are people, uh, you know, what are the main grounds people are, uh, or activists or groups that are opposing this on? Well, for one, there is very clear uh, attempt to support the current Marcos Jr. government. And obviously, coming at uh, the time when Marcos Jr. is in power uh, is something that has alarmed a lot of people because obviously, attempts to change the constitution or the constitution. Uh, that was framed uh, in response to to overthrow or replace the dictatorial system that existed under Marcus Jr.'s father uh, is something that has obviously alarmed a lot of people. But specifically speaking, it's the, uh, as I pointed out, it's the part where they want to change foreign ownership laws. And these are things that are constitutionally regulated. These are not simply laws that can be changed by the Congress. These are things that the con uh, that the that that has to be a constitutional amendment, or you know, a sweeping constitutional amendment of the kind that we've seen very recently in Indonesia and other places. Uh, and that is something that uh, alarms a lot of people because that could imply a lot of things. And we do not know the final blueprint of what these uh, people's initiatives, so-called people's initiatives can actually bring about. Uh, but definitely a lot of resources, private money uh, is being funneled into it. Obviously, the people who are considered to be leftovers or left outs of the revolution uh, have been named as landowners. Uh, businessmen, uh, entrepreneurs, and st so on and so forth. So we are very clearly seeing elite, uh, you know, Filipino elite, obviously. But there's also uh, foreign uh, capitalists being involved in here. And there is complete opacity of how who is funding these programs and, you know, where this money is coming from and who is behind this, obviously. So all of that has actually, uh, you know, created alarm bells for uh, for a lot of people, for a lot of progressive activists, but also many who are wary of foreign capitalist, pred uh, it's predatory nature, obviously, uh, into the Filipino economy. And that is something uh, that has been highlighted in the current set of protests that we are also seeing in Philippines. Thank you so much for the update. And that's all we have today. We'll be back with a fresh episode tomorrow. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button.